All right, so this is, of course, the first Sunday of Advent, which means that I had to choose an Advent text. What would our text be that we worked our way through uh, on our Sundays of Advent and, of course, on Christmas Eve as well? Uh, and this year we're going to be taking a look at the Nativity narrative in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and if you were here in December of 2012, and I know some of you were, uh, some of you were not, but some of you were here in December of 2012, uh, you might remember with crystal clear uh, accuracy and memory that I've already preached this text. I don't normally do that. You know that's my pattern. I keep track of the texts I've already preached. Uh, there's so much of the Word, uh, there's not much chance that I'm going to get through all of it in the years uh, I have, even if I make it to Joe's 100, uh, that's still a tough order. Uh, so I don't like to go back, but when we get to Christmas, when we get to Easter, there are less texts to deal with. Obviously, with Christmas, there's even less. We've got Luke, we've got Matthew, John uh, has a the uh, philosophical approach. Uh, Mark doesn't give us any. We can look at Isaiah, we can look at Micah, we can look at a few prophecies. We've done all of those. In the years that I've been here, we've looked at all of them already. So we're going back to the beginning. So excuse me if you remember everything I said from the Gospel of Luke back in 2012. I don't remember, so I'm pretty sure you don't remember. And I didn't look at my notes and my messages from then. This is a fresh approach, a fresh take on it. So I wanted to remind ourselves of the things that we enjoy more than once. And I'll start with myself. Uh, on the top of the picture there are the Lord of the Rings books. Uh, the Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, The Return of the King. I'm actually reading Return of the King right now. Uh, I think this is about the 18th or 19th time that I will have read that series of novels. It's, of course, my favorite. I'm in the Return of the King right now. The Rohirrim is on their way to Minas Tirith. The city is under siege. It's an awesome point in the story, uh, but I, and I will keep going in the days ahead. I've read it a bunch. Star Wars is the movie I've seen the most in life. You're not shocked by that. Probably, I would say, I don't know, 30 times or so. It's hard to say. Uh, and, of course, my wife's favorite is Jurassic Park. Uh, we've been married some years now, married in 2001. I think we've watched Jurassic Park together at least 20 times. And she thinks it's higher. Uh, it's a lot. We've seen it a lot. <laughs> the dinosaurs eat people. It's the same every time. Um, and then on the right, I put some of the Christmas favorites, right? Some of you watch the same thing at Christmas every year, right? It's a Wonderful Life, uh, Miracle on 34th Street, Street uh, Christmas Story, which I can't stand that movie, but some of you like it. Uh, Christmas Vacation with Chevy Chase is a winner. Um, some of us grew up watching the animated, that, that claymation thing uh, of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or uh, Frosty the Snowman. It was on once a year at Christmas on one of the three channels that we got, right? Way back in the day when there were only three channels on the TV. Will, you won't understand this. Believe it or not that we, we had three, maybe four channels, uh, and they only showed that once a year, and we'd pay attention, and we all sat down and watched it every year. Uh, it was an amazing thing. The Gospel's account of the birth of Jesus here in Luke is like that. We've seen it before, you're familiar with the story, but old favorites, we like to sing the old songs again, we like to read the old stories again, watch the old movies again, the ones that really move us. Uh, and so we will return to the Gospel of Luke. We'll pick it up in verse 26. Uh, so we'll begin here in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, with the first half of verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Well, that gives us our context for where we are starting. If we'd read the first part of the Gospel of Luke, we would have seen the uh, encounter between Zechariah and the angel Gabriel within the temple where Gabriel tells Zechariah, you will have a son and he will be great. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a big deal. And Zechariah says, how can I know that's going to be true? And Gabriel says, here's the thing, man. I stand before God. Don't doubt me. And for the rest, from that day until the child was born, Zechariah was mute. Didn't say a word. I don't know how that works going through his wife's pregnancy without speaking. 
I don't know if that would have helped them or made it harder. You and I can, uh, we can all think about that. Elizabeth is now six months pregnant, three months away from the birth of John, who will be called later John the Baptist. Like her husband, Elizabeth is also a, uh, who serves as a priest, that's what Zechariah's role is. She is also a descendant of Moses' brother Aaron. If you remember Aaron in the book of Exodus, he was Moses' spokesperson. He was a priest. He was an important figure, and there is a line of descendants from Aaron still serving at the temple. Both Zechariah and Elizabeth are described as being upright in the sight of God. They were good moral people, and now she is six months pregnant. Now, for Elizabeth, that is a miracle because she is, as they say, past the childbearing years. They did not believe they were ever going to have a child. They had given up. And now, an angel has foretold that she would become pregnant and get, have a son, and I'm sure everybody in and around Jerusalem is aware they're talking about it. Who will this boy be? This is a big deal. People are paying attention. So we're six months into that, and this happens. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. So while big things are happening in Jerusalem and everyone is paying attention to Zechariah and Elizabeth to see who their son would be, we go far afield to Nazareth. Nazareth is an out-of-the-way village far removed from the spotlight of Jerusalem. It is in Galilee, far in the north. It is surrounded by Gentile lands to the west, to the north, to the east, Galilee had a reputation, at least back in Jerusalem, whether it was deserved or not, as being not as, not as with it in terms of Judaism. They were a little lax in their keeping of the law of Moses. At least that's how they looked down at them from Jerusalem, kind of literally down because Jerusalem up in the mountains. To Nazareth in da Galilee goes the angel Gabriel. The name Gabriel means man of God. Fairly appropriate there. Along with Michael, who we're told is the archangel, he's the only angel that has a name, at least that we are told in the Bible. Gabriel is the one that went to Zechariah, and when he was with Zechariah, he said to him, I stand in the presence of God. Gabriel went to Zechariah. Now he's in Nazareth. What is he doing in Nazareth? A little bit different. It says, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Mary, we are told, is a virgin. That is not unusual or extraordinary for someone in her state. She's a teenager. She's a young woman, a young Jewish woman who comes from a pious family, from a family that follows the law of Moses. And so in obedience to the law of Moses, she is a virgin until she's married. She would not have been, of course, the only one, perhaps not even the only one in Nazareth that was pledged to be married, but had that same quality. She is pledged to be married, and we would call this engagement, but it's a little bit more than that, because back then, this pledge was legally binding. They were considered married. The only way to get out of a marriage uh, pledge, a marriage contract, would be a divorce. Or if you're the person that you were pledged to be married, if that person dies before the marriage, you are considered a widow or a widower. Uh, so they took it quite seriously. That contract would have been signed, would have been sealed between Joseph's father and Mary's father, probably uh, when Mary was even younger, long before they're ready for her to be married. But as soon as she uh, comes probably into puberty, they would say, okay, let's find her, her husband. And then some years later, they would be married. During that time of betrothal, the, they were certainly not allowed to be sexually active with each other, but they were considered legally bound together. So that is who Mary is, and of course the fact that she is obedient to the law, that she is still a virgin, will be significant later on. We will see the importance of that as we continue. The man that she is pledged to is a man named Joseph. 
We don't know much about him other than that he is a carpenter by trade, which means that in this day and age, he's probably lower class. He's not a landowner. He doesn't have large acres of land that he's farming with laborers working for him like uh, Boaz was that Ruth married. He was a man of means. Joseph doesn't appear to be. He and his family live in Nazareth. We don't know why. We'll learn later that they're from the area of Bethlehem. What drove them north? Was it an economic opportunity? What, is, was it, what was it? What sent them up to Nazareth in Galilee? We don't know. But we know that he was a descendant of David. And this is the most important thing about Joseph, other than his moral qualities, which we will soon see. It is a key fact of his heritage He is one of the men who can claim the throne of David. He's not the only one, right? Over time, there are a good number of descendants of David. There would be cousins of uh, Joseph and and uncles and, uh, and his father and other relatives that would have had a similar claim to the throne of David. Provided, of course, that you could get Herod to get off the throne, He's sitting on it right now, and provided you could get the Romans out of Judea. But those two little things, of course, which are huge things aside, uh, Joseph has the right to the throne. Given that God pledged to David and promised to him that the Messiah would come from his line, would be one of his descendants, that's no small thing. And given the fact that God promised to David and to his son Solomon that that throne would be established forever, this is a big deal. But it's been hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years since a descendant of David has sat on that throne. It's not been occupied by a Jew in several hundred years, let alone a descendant of David So you got to wonder how seriously they took that. Yes, there's some pride in that. There's some family uh, heritage to be able to say you're a descendant of somebody. But nothing's come of it for a long time. So now an angel has come to the pledged bride-to-be of Joseph. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. As an angel, put yourself in an angel's shoes for a moment, how does one start a conversation with a mortal who is always already going to be freaking out when they see you, right? An angel appears, the person you're talking to is going to be scared to death because you just p- appeared in front of them. How, what do you say that doesn't make it worse? Hi is probably <laughs> the, the easiest thing, right? Hello, nice to see you, right? That's what the angel said. Considering Mary's response, it reminds me of how often uh, in this church building in the middle of the week or in the evening, somebody has been spooked by seeing somebody else. You might think you're alone here. Uh, Just yesterday, Clara walked into the office and gave Cheryl a bit of a fright. Didn't see her coming. She thought she was the only one here. A couple days earlier in the week, Clara walked into the sanctuary when Tunda wa- was working in here with her headphones on and gave her one. Yeah. She's scary. You know? <laughs> I've done the same thing, right? Walk around a corner and there's somebody else in the building and you go, whoa, all right? You've probably had that happen to yourself somewhere at home when you, if you thought you were the only one or something like that, you're, you're, or the dog scares you or something. He says, greetings. And then he says, you who are highly favored, which is interesting, uh, because we're thinking, in what way is she highly favored? For what reason is she highly favored? More on that in a minute. The question, of course, was it something about Mary and who she was, the kind of person she was, her ancestry? Was it something about Mary that made her highly favored? Or was it what the message was about to be? What will happen to you next will show that God is highly favoring you. It's actually a little bit of both. 
while, un while undoubtedly a woman of high moral character, a woman who sought the Lord, someone that we ought to respect in life, Mary will not be a unique person. She's not unique among Jewish women in her day. She's not unique among Jews in general. A couple like Mary and Joseph, where there is a descendant from David, where they are betrothed, and yet the woman is a virgin, such couples would have been rare, of course, but not unique. If there's not another one in Judea right now, there will be soon, or there would have been a little while ago. God could have gone to one of them, but he chose Joseph and Mary. God favored them with his grace. He, he chose to make them unique in his plan, to work through her and then later through Joseph, making her perhaps the most highly favored human being in history because God chose her for this role. And I'll say one brief thing before we move on as we continue with our Advent story focusing quite a bit on Mary. Because of history... Because of the historical divide between Catholics who clearly revere Mary, we all know that. If you ask some, somebody, what do you know about Catholics, one of the two or three things they'll know is that it have something to do with Mary. And of course, Protestants, and in many Protestant churches, you might not even know that Mary exists. There's never going to be a painting of her. Nobody talks about her. Uh, she seems to be lost. That's not quite right because that's unnecessary and foolish. Mary ought to be admired. We have dozens of heroes in the Bible, whether it's David or Moses or, or Esther or Ruth, uh, Paul, all sorts of people in the Scriptures that we can uh, hold up as examples because of what they did, because of their character, because of the choices they made, and we can admire them for what God did in and through their lives. And we should treat Mary the same way, just like Elizabeth, just like all the rest. He says, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. What he's about to say next could be looked at as a burden, as a risk, as something that you wouldn't call a blessing. But Gabriel is assuring Mary before she knows the details of what's about to happen that this is a sign of the favor of God. This is a sign that God is in relationship with you, that God is with you. In response to that, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Well, why was she greatly troubled? If we look back at the history of people's interaction with angels, if you remember Gideon, Gideon was hiding, uh, threshing the wheat in a wine press, hiding from the, the, the army that was marauding Judea at the time. An angel appeared to him, and he responded with hesitancy. He responded with doubt. He responded with trepidation. If you think of Moses, when God spoke to him from the burning bush, Moses' first response was, that's great, but choose somebody else. That's, that's a good idea, but I'm the last person you want for it. Most people, when they see an angel, are scared, they're worried, they're afraid. And so Gabriel has said to Mary, you are highly favored, God is with you. And she goes, oh no, what is this? What is going on? What kind of greeting could this be? She's a teenage girl, and she must be wondering, what does God want with me? I'm not Gideon, right? I'm, she, he's not calling me to lead an army against the Romans. I'm not Moses. He's not calling me to lead the people out of bondage. What does he want with me? It's an, ex an excellent question. She has no idea, and so she's troubled. She's afraid. She's worried. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. In our art, such as this uh, picture on the screen is Leonardo's uh, Annunciation. That means the, the announcement. In our art, angels are almost invariably pictured with these as beautiful be beings, right? Better looking than we are, uh, just the ideal of humanity. They've got these beautiful uh, wings. Everybody draws them with wings for some reason. Uh, 
they seem like something in awe. If you remember back in the day when Touched by an Angel was on, they, they, they picked uh, non-threatening threatening people, right? If that person appeared to you, you'd say, hey, this, this can't be so bad. But in the Bible, everybody freaks out when they see an angel. So something is not right. And I think it's the reflection of the glory of God. This is someone who stands in the presence of God. When they come into our world, there is something there that, that frightens us because we're not used to seeing holiness. We're not used to seeing perfection. So he says, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. He said that already. He says it again. He's trying to make sure that she will hear what will come next. And what is about to come is a doozy. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. Now, we're not going to talk about the how of the word conceive yet, because that's next week's text. But rest assured, it is not in the usual way. The angel Gabriel would not have come to Mary and said, after you get married to Joseph, right, uh, about a year later, after your marriage, you're going to have a son. Yay, congratulations. This is not that, because the angel Gabriel would not come to tell Mary, oh, by the way, someday you're going to have a son, because that would be usual, expected, normal. Now, 50-50 that she's going to have a son or a daughter first, right? Uh, in this case, it's got to be a son because he is the descendant of David, Jewish boys would be named and circumcised on the eighth day. They didn't have a name. They weren't given the name. Um, maybe their mom or their dad probably knew what the name was, but you didn't officially give it to them until their eighth day when they were circumcised. And that name is normally chosen by the Father. That was just the way they did it. Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua. So it's a very common Jewish name. There are a lot of people named Joshua. In, or Yeshua in uh, Israeli, in Jewish history, in the first century, and to this day. It's still a common name. It meant the Lord saves. It's a good name. Matthew will add, call, they will call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Give a connection to the meaning of the name. So Mary is told, you're going to have a son, and you're going to give him the name Jesus. Not an unusual name. It's not that far off from Joseph. Maybe Joseph would have chosen that name. Hard to say. But that's just the beginning. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now, greatness would be expected of a child if the birth is foretold by an angel, right? If an angel comes, comes to you and says, you are going to have a daughter, you are going to have a son, you would expect that that child would be important, right? That would be expected. They're going to be great somehow. Jesus, for Jesus, greatness is just the beginning. John is great. John the Baptist was a great man and did great things for the Lord. But great is where we start with Jesus. He says he will also be called the Son of the Most High. He will be called God's Son. That's a surprise. That's where Mary's wheels are going to start spinning, and she's going to start thinking, okay, what? Next week we will look at the text, and we will see exactly how that is literally true, that he is going to be the Son of God. That's an amazing title. We're told that Enoch walked with God, that Moses was the friend of God. That's an amazing thing. We're told that David was a man after God's own heart. All of those titles, all of those descriptions, we'd be happy to be called that. He will be called the Son of the Most High. Whatever this is that Gabriel is sharing with Mary, it is far more than Enoch or David or Moses or any of them. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. God will give it to him. It is part of his plan. It is the fulfillment of his promise to David. It is a demonstration of the divine power of God to give him this throne. The right to rule the descendants of Abraham. It is invariably connected to Jerusalem. You cannot sit on the throne of David if you do not control Jerusalem. That wouldn't be the throne of David. 
It is a position, of course, that cannot currently be fulfilled. This throne, while vacant, is not available when Gabriel tells this to Mary. And then he ends with this, and here's the real kicker. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. David was told that your, descend, your kingdom would, live for, would last forever. He was not told you will live forever. He wasn't told your son will live forever. That throne will endure. Gabriel tells Mary he will reign forever. As the Son of God, he will have the ability to be the Messiah. As the child of Mary and Joseph, he will have the right to the kingdom of Israel. Both of those parts of the nature of who Jesus will be are important. We need to understand both the human and the divine. He will rule over Jacob's descendants. That's Abraham's grandson, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob was the father of the twelve tribes. He was named, renamed Israel forever. How on earth is that going to be possible? Mary at this point, can have no idea, no understanding. How can a child that she is going to have reign forever? In other words, how could he be immortal? That is make, how, how is this going to be possible? His kingdom will never end. Currently, there is no Davidic kingdom. There's a province of Rome. So is this child that has been predicted going to be a mighty warrior like David? Is he going to be the king on the white horse with the flaming sword and all that. It will never end. His reign, his kingdom will not end. How could this be possible? These are wondrous words from Gabriel given to Mary. And there are plenty of room for follow-up questions. If you put yourselves, yourself in Mary's shoes with this information, there are a half a dozen excellent questions that you would want to ask next. Next week, we will see exactly what the very first one was on Mary's mind. This is a wondrous prediction full of amazing things, and yet it also has amazing questions that come after it. We will continue the story next week. Three things I want us to take away from this week. Number one, that the visit of Gabriel to Mary was a key part of a much larger plan. We began by talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth, but we know that it goes all the way back to David and beyond David to Abraham. These, this is the plan of God. This is the key moment in it, the beginning of that key moment. But there are so many other things that God is about in making this happen. Secondly, because Joseph and Mary were morally upright, God could use them to fulfill this plan. They weren't the only people that fit this description, but because they were morally upright, because they sought God, because they believed, they had faith, they were not immoral, they were not disobedient to the law, because they were useful, God put them to use. Something for us to remember. And then thirdly, the promises of God will always be fulfilled. Didn't matter how long that throne was vacant, didn't matter how long ago that promise was, it remained. And when God makes a promise, He keeps it.